Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shervan Beri is a doctor from Rojava. He is a co-director of the Kurdish Red Crescent and he works for the Kurdish Red Crescent since 2012. And he has been closely following the fight and fighting on the front line the issue of COVID-19 pandemic in Rojava and the north of Syria. Dr. Shervan? Beli, Dembash, Evara Abkhir. دست به گیس پاسیوت کم و کردکات کو اف سمیر حاضر کریه سپاسیا هر دو حوالی من دکتر بهروز دکتر خالص جیت کم براستی از بی شانسی جی وقت بگرم از سپاسیا که بشیم جه همو دکتر این ایبا کوری کردستان یا جی دکتر خالص جی بگرم که هر دو ناس ناکن لی دیدمک دریج دا علی کاریا رو جاوا کرن تایبت دما سینور و کریبون امبیجن اودیا در منصازا یا آمده یا آنو سیبینی گلک دستکش برو جوای کردستانی کرین دما حوجیتی در اسپاسیا خوشوان جی شینم از هیب انگلیزی بیش مز باورم بلکی باشتر بیش بهنک کس هنه دکتر توماس از باورم اوجی حاضره اوجی علی کارو بمره گلک دما حاتیه رو جوا ج نمسایی اوستریا so I would uh, speak in English even if even if my English is not so perfect, but uh, I would do my best. Uh, Dr. Thomas is here also. Dr. Thomas was, was joining us in Rojava many times, supporting our activities in the Kurdish Red Crescent. Uh, I'm a doctor. I graduated from Damascus in 2012, um, and directly I joined the Kurdish Red Crescent, which was also formed in the end of 2012. Uh, Heiva Sora Kurd is separated from the Hevasora Kurdistan, which is in Europe, but we are partners, let's say, and they are big supporters to us. Uh, our organization was formed due to the lack of uh, medical care to the wounded people, uh, first of all. Uh, we had a lot of injuries, as you may know, since there is a war, uh, and uh, here is not like other part of Kurdistan, more or less. Um, we started with a few people, some lawyers, some doctors, with a few ambulances to rescue the people, but then step by step, more load come to our shoulders. Um, I worked also as a paramedic for a long time then, um, and for now I'm working as co-director with uh, our friend. Um, we are leading this organization. Uh, right now we have uh, almost 1,500 workers with us, doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, uh, distributed in uh, 35 health facilities, primary health centers and hospitals, also trauma stabilization points, and uh, almost we have 60 ambulances. Um, again, I would thank you for this invitation, and this was very brief. Um, announcement about, about myself and the organization that I work for. Uh, regarding the situation in North Syria, as you are all aware and uh, Rojava is facing uh, uh, big problems with the war, uh, we already uh, missed almost half of our medical staff. I mean, doctors, nurses. Because of the war, they, they have been uh, displaced and went to uh, other countries. Um, so that this um, bring more weight on our shoulders. I mean, the doctors, the medical staff who are already working there, or here, sorry. Uh, so far, and for COVID situation, I can say uh, we are lucky. We were lucky. We didn't have a lot of cases or confirmed cases. Um, COVID-19 was confirmed in Syria in um, March. Uh, 22 of March. The first case was in Damascus, but as you know and everybody know, the Syrian government is not so uh, transparent with its people and also for part of it with Kurdish people in Rojava. So they don't share the information very clearly. They say we have for now 372 cases of COVID-19 in all Syria but we are sure that the number is much more higher than this because we know colleagues in Damascus or in other places of Syria working in the front line, let's say, of, of fighting this disease, they say there is much more cases, but um, due to the capacity and everything, there is no um, 
no, um, let's say, uh, clear numbers or clear um, uh, confirmed numbers. Um, in North Syria and in Rojava, and maybe some of you know, we didn't have even the PCR machine which confirms the, the, the COVID-19 uh, disease. And uh, with the support of our brothers in Bashur, um, Kurdistan region of Iraq, we get this device or the health department of North Syria of Rojava. And now the reason it's active. Um, for my organization, what we were doing and due to the lake of the medical staff and because we were actually learning from the others, fortunately we get this disease late, let's say. I mean, after it was separated, after the information was separated, Unfortunately, there is not a lot of channels or airports or gates or borders um, that everybody can go and come like other countries like in Europe. So uh, that's why we're closed somehow. And we could do some procedures that prevented us. I mean, the self-administration started very uh, early quarantine, which was the key point of keeping the disease away of the people of Rojava. Um, the the tragedy or the story which happened with us it was um that during um the, the first case it was um in, i mean in in rojava it was in 29 of march the confirmation of the case this was the first case uh, or zero case um was second of april and also the person or the patient died or passed away at the same date, I mean, 2nd of April. Um, the Syrian government, health department, and WHO of Syria were aware of the case, but we were not aware of that, neither us, I mean, in Kurdish Red Crescent, nor the self-administration health department, neither the MSF, Medicine Sun Frontiers, or other health partners, those active here. We were, not aware, we were not aware of that until 16 of uh, April. So almost two weeks of the first uh, confirmation. Um, the information come to us, not directly also, uh, and we couldn't do anything. So usually when you have the first case, you do contact tracing for the case. Um, even though we, do, we did the contact tracing and after, uh, the procedure that we do, it was suggested to the self-administration and the health department to close all the neighborhood in that area, which was in Haseke, and uh, there was a full quarantine. Um, six uh, members of the same family were uh, contaminated and con get the virus, but all of them recovered, only the zero case passed away. So we have the disease in one cluster. It was not spreaded to any other parts of North Syria and Rojava. At the, the meantime, we were distributing health uh, or uh, hygiene keys, um, brochures. We almost, as Kurdish Red Crescent alone, we distributed uh, almost half million of brochures and the media helped us too much to, to distribute the information in both languages, Kurdish and Arabic. Um, it was very useful, um, and again, I would not say that we were very uh, like the best to manipulate with this disease, but we were lucky, first of all, and the disease came late. So all the people were already informed about the situation and following what's happening in Italy, for example, in Spain. The other thing that we did, and uh, it was also after thinking and counseling with many of friends or doctors, as we have few number of medical staff, we suggested that to not have many health facilities to um, receive uh, suspected or confirmed cases, but to keep them, any suspected case, in one place. I mean, big, build a big hospital only dedicated for COVID-19. We did this in Haseke as Kurdish Red Crescent with the support of Heva Sora Kurdistan in Europe in Germany, and it was um, uh, 120 bits. So 
it was uh, very useful. And in this way, we will not need a lot of staff also. At the beginning, the idea was to separate them in many different areas. I mean, separate the medical staff. So uh, we changed this idea. We have now also a dedicated hospital only for COVID-19 in Membej with 110 beds. The same in Tapka with 60 beds. This is what Kurdish Recreation is supporting. Uh, already there is other, other um, um, health facilities. So in total, we have 500, almost 500 beds dedicated for COVID-19. And uh, our idea was to not having them separated in small uh, places, but to have them always together. And in this way, to protect ourselves and our staff as well, like to uh, bring a lot of PPEs in these areas, have the lab in, within it, and the, um, the same for the um, incinerators and so on. So to have even the waste, uh, of this uh, medical uh, thing inside the the facility to not to not have them in different uh, areas so far we were succeeding in this fortunately and i hope we can do but now the cases in both sides and neighbors are rising too much i mean in bakure kurdistan as dr khas was uh, telling and since long time uh, the cases are uh, the number of the cases are high the same in Bashur, there is a lot of cases. The same in, in Damascus and other parts of Syria. Uh, in July of this month, again, the self-administration started will start a quarantine to close all the borders again, only have them open for the uh, urgent uh, or humanitarian cases. Um, one of the biggest problem that we face it as well is uh, the refugees and the IDPs that we have. Um, we have in Rojava in North Syria, uh, six camps and almost 120,000 refugees and IDPs. One example of them is al Hol camp. Maybe you are all aware of it, 10,000 of those people. al Hol camp is 67,000 people. Um, 10,000 of them are ISIS former families. Um, and it's in Haseke governorate. After the Turkish occupation of, of Sarekanye, they cut it, the water on Haseke governorate where there is almost half million of people living there. Um, for example, we were going to the camp and doing awareness campaigns, telling the people you have to wash your hand more regularly. One phase of, of this camp, it was really sad story. Some people say, we're telling, okay, there is no water, how can I wash my hand? So this is a very um, bad thing that you cannot doing, do any, anything against it. The same since yesterday or before, Turkey is still cutting the water uh, on Haseke more regularly to let the people uh, come against, be nervous. Um, and the same, one of the biggest problem that we face now, they cut the water of Euphrat. Since long time, we didn't have seen Euphrates have low water capacity as we see in those days. So it's war in different uh, uh, way, which also impact the fight against COVID-19 in North Syria. Um, we are sure that this disease is used by other uh, countries as political weapon against us. For example, for the Syrian government, I'm sure they will be happy if we have any case here, I mean, politically view. And um, fortunately, the Syrian administration did this um, um, decision that they will make a quarantine. We will have only some medical or some students, they will go and come to other parts of Syria, almost between 3,000 to 5,000. At the other part, all the... Um, the borders or point of entry will be closed officially. Um, this was um, very, uh, very briefly about the the, the situation and um, what um, what we did and uh, what's uh, happening. Uh, for for other procedures that we managed to do together with the health department and also considering the lack of the uh, doctors, nurses, and all the stuff that we have, we are, we we have in North Syria, 
we divided the area to many, uh, to let's say five uh, places. In each place, we have uh, a committee, a COVID committee that are responding under uh, one leadership, which is the health department or the self-administration, and always the Kurdish Red Crescent, which is our organization, is a technical supporter of this. Uh, from our side, we do contact tracing, supporting the hospitals, and we have an operation disk to refer the cases with almost 20 ambulances dedicated only for COVID-19 in, in Rojava. Um, this was very short uh, description of what we have. Again, I will say we were lucky so far, but I, I think and all the experts think that um, soon it will come. I mean, a second wave as it will be called. And we already see it um, on the way in Damascus and other, uh, other areas. Um, I don't know, I think Dr. Thomas was asking about PCR. I don't know what was the question. I didn't manage to read it all. Uh, Sorry, I wanted to ask if there is still no PCR machine, because I heard that meanwhile there is at least one smuggled in and the question is if there is still until today no possibility for testing. Uh, no, doctor, we, we have PCR machine and uh, it's working. We have kits for almost 10,000 cases that we can test. And soon, uh, hopefully, we will manage to bring more uh, kits of testing and also more equipment. Um, one of the most problem also maybe you are aware um, yesterday was uh, in the United Nations Security Council. Again, they refused to open the gate uh, between Rojava and Iraq to get the United Nations support, which was Yarobia or Tilkocher. After the resolution in 10 of January 2018, 2020, sorry, uh, the border was totally closed. I mean, uh, between Rojava and Iraq and since that time, we didn't get any support directly from uh, the UN agencies as we were getting before. Um, the only uh, way that we are getting now is from Damascus, the UN offices in Damascus and agencies from Damascus. They also face a lot of um, problems uh, and they need a lot of permissions to, to bring those materials and PPEs that's why we had to depend on the local market. I mean, to create PPEs, masks, and so on. Um, and so far we have uh, enough, let's say. Um, one of the most important thing also uh, is the economic situation in Syria. Um, when the self-administration did the quarantine in April, the last time, and uh, many families and you know um, here there is already war that uh, pushed too much on the economy and now in june the caesar rule let's say uh, on all syria uh, increased this problem uh, together with the kurdish diaspora and our partners in hevasura kurdistan in europe we could make this campaign of twin or uh, brotherhood between families um, in all Kurdistan, we managed to put 5,000 families together with uh, families in Europe that could support them with monthly, almost more or less 100 euro uh, for three months. In Rojava, um, we had 800 uh, families that were twin with other uh, families in Europe that economically were better. Considering this also, so the new, the new decision of the Serbian administration for the uh, next quarantine decision, which will be in 13 of this month of July, um, the economical situation have considered very highly. And it seems that we will manage or we have to manage a way to combine the economical situation of the people together with the quarantine. We cannot oblige the people in this situation to stay home and ask them to not work and ask them to not go anyway or anywhere. And 
where they are facing economical situation. So this will be considered very highly and um, awareness will be uh, the first weapon, let's say, telling the people to wear masks as much as possible, as the doctors before me were telling also, the normal or regular uh, COVID-19 prevention um, procedures, uh, social distancing. So this is um, our um, way or tools in the next step. Uh, again, we are preparing our hospitals. Uh, fortunately, we, have, we had only six cases until now, but we think in the coming wave, maybe Rojava will be uh, facing some problems in this, as we are also lacking water and we have uh, other pressure on us. So um, I can say this uh, very briefly and uh, any question from any colleague is welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Shervan. Just there's uh, another question, but I think the after speeches, already we will have a Q&A section. And if they have question, I think it will be good during the Q&A section, they can ask you in person. Mm -hmm. And, but uh, I have question. Can you, Dr. Shervan, please uh, briefly uh, talk about the station, health station in Afrin. I know, Mm -hmm. Afrin is occupied, and but we are wonder how they are coping with this uh, crisis, COVID-19. Do you have any uh, information, or, or how is the situation going in Afrin? Um, unfortunately, we don't have access to Afrin itself, but we work in Shehba area, which is, uh, let's say, the uh, countryside of Afrin, and our people were displaced to there, almost 100,000 our people are there and our team are working there. Uh, fortunately, also you managed to pass a PCR machine to there because we cannot trust Syrian government and especially for, for those people, for our people. Um, so far they are fine. I mean, the displaced people, but within Afrin, within under the occupation of Turkey and also with the jihadist rebels, uh, we hear, we don't have an access actually, we hear there is a lot of cases. And somehow some friends are telling that um, Turkey or the, the jihadist group are doing in purpose to bring contamination or um, um, confirmed cases to there. There was, I think it was New York Times or very official New York paper, um, um, a journal telling that there is a total um, rebellion in Afrin was uh, contaminated. The same was in Serikani and Rasaline. A lot of cases and the hospital that we were working before in uh, Rasaline in Serikani, Roche Hospital, they make it a hospital for hosting COVID cases. This is the information what we were getting. Uh, it's already spread in, in, uh, North Kurdistan, in North Kurdistan and in Turkey, this disease. And um, somehow they want to pass. There is illegal ways. There is, uh, uh, the border are open. The people, are, some of them are managing to go and come to this occupied area so they can easily bring uh, this disease uh, inside Rojava. Uh, within Afrin, the situation of COVID-19 is um somehow let's say it's more or less like turkey inside turkey but in other uh, aspects human rights aspects i think everybody knows this it's very very bad uh, unfortunately again we don't have an access because we are not welcomed by them the same in uh, sarekanye and uh, grispi talabiyat um, so this is the case there. Unfortunately, also the media um, cannot focus or move easily there. You know, um, the media in Turkey has becoming facing a lot of troubles to to bring the the truth, uh, and more most of them are in jail uh, who are giving this information to 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 their media or in public. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Shervan.